Hello, thank you for joining us today here on the Motor City Church YouTube channel. We're so excited to connect with you and to bring you life-giving, hope-filled messages. I encourage you, take just a moment, hit that subscribe button. Go ahead, hit the subscribe button. Also, make sure that you like this video and we'd love to hear how it's helped you. Please do that and we look forward to connecting with you more and more right here at Motor City Church. Today's message, I believe, is going to be a great encouragement to you and your life. We've been in this series called Relationship Goals. Relationship Goals goals we've been through we've been on it for the last month and a half or so and we've been exploring the the fact and, and uh, the reality that nobody ever enters a relationship expecting for it to fall apart no one enters into a relationship uh, uh ex looking for that but yet we've all experienced we've all experienced brokenness in relationships we've all experienced dysfunction in relationships and 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 this means that, that we, sometimes we slip. Remember the first week we talked about relation slips. We slip into unintended habits or uh, attitudes or, or actions that cause uh, uh, dysfunction and cause things to happen in our relationships. So this series was meant to really help us avoid some of those painful pitfalls that happen in the relationships with the people that we love. And we've been taking the whole study from a, an Old Testament figure named Abraham, great hero of the faith. And, and when we think about Abraham, um, he was great, faith-filled, but very dysfunctional when it came to his relationships. His story speaks to every one of our stories, no matter what season we're in. And uh, throughout this series, we've covered just about every season I think you can be in. We've covered singleness, and we've covered, covered parenting, and we've covered marriage, and we've covered friendship. So we've, we've covered all the areas that we can uh, think of. And so today, I want to close out the series by speaking to those who have or are dealing with heartbreak heartbreak in their relationships. And so um, we'll just call this Heartbreak Hotel. <laughs> no, I know y'all are expecting a little Elvis. Since the... Uh, I, I wanted to be an Elvis impersonator. I don't know if y'all knew that. If I ever, have I ever told y'all that? I have a good friend that's an Elvis impersonator in Vegas. He does weddings and all that. I, actually, I want to get him to come to church sometime. Uh, I'm a big Elvis fan. Any, Elvis, any other Elvis fans in here? Come on. All right, we got a few. Thank you. All right, good. Yeah, yeah. But I was going to be a Christian one, so I was going to rewrite the Elvis songs, make them Christian versions. Like, since the devil left me. Like Christian versions of the song. Like, I found a new place to dwell. It's down at the end of the golden streets. It's Heaven's Hotel. See, it's like that. And... Uh, I'm feeling so holy, baby. Anyway, um, I had one for the Father, a two for the Son, a three for the Holy Ghost, three in one. Okay, so um, anyway, anyway, those are my heartbreak hotel. Matt Lieberman, Matthew Lieberman, he's a neuroscientist. Uh, he noticed that we, we tend to use the language of physical pain when we talk about relational pain. We say things like, she broke my heart. Or, or those words were like a punch in the, in the gut. And this made Lieberman curious, and he decided to do a study uh, of, about the difference in the brain when we experience physical pain compared to when we experience emotional pain. And his findings were pretty astonishing as they scanned the brain of someone experiencing physical pain. They placed it side by side with someone who was experiencing emotional pain, and they found that there was no difference. And it was pretty much news to the scientific community, but not to, it's not really news to anyone who's experienced some heartbreak. It's not news to anyone who's, who's experienced the loss of a, of a spouse, maybe or a breakup, or a divorce, or uh, the, just the loss of love, a loveless marriage. It, it, to love is to be caught in this kind of great irony, because you cannot love without opening your heart, right? But, but by opening your heart, you risk the pain that comes from things that you cannot control the outcomes of. And, and after enough pain, uh, well, we tend to subconsciously guard ourselves from future pain. 
we've all heard this we've all been through this and and uh, and so we we do that though we, the way we guard ourselves from future pain or pain again is usually unhealthy ways that we do it, it not one of them is sometimes you get a hard heart we've heard that we've heard people man, it's such a hard heart maybe they've been through some pain and they've they put what well, the bible talks about a stony heart and we're to have a heart of flesh. But what happens when you get a hard heart? You become closed off. You begin to isolate. Matthew 19 talks about that. When, when, a, spouse, uh, when a, a spouse's heart becomes hard, it brings a lot of pain to the other spouse. So that for the benefit of the person, even in the Bible, Moses granted a certificate of divorce to be issued so that that person, the, the spouse of the person with the hard heart could remarry. I mean, because you think, I mean, I think it was a concession for the, the benefit of the other person having to live their life or go through that hard heart. With a hard heart comes hurt, and everyone, everyone blames the person with the hard heart. But all they're doing is they're trying to protect themselves from the hurt and the things that they felt or the things that they've dealt with. So we want to deal with maybe those who are in the room today who are, are dealing with a hard heart. You've closed off, you've isolated. Some people can get a poison heart. A poisoned heart, where you become cynical, bitterness, cynical, bitterness and, and anger um, come in. And, and uh, you know, what, what poisons are, when someone with a poisoned heart, maybe they gossip about their spouse. They talk negatively. Someone who, who tries to turn others against you. Those kind of things come from a, a poisoned heart. Maybe they talk to their, their children to try to pit them against the other spouse. All those, those cynical, all those things come out of a poisoned heart. And then Lastly, could some people have a, are, become half-hearted, half-hearted, never, never really given the full effort, lacking commitment, and eventually they just give up. There's no hope. This thing's never going to change. They just, or, or maybe they, they, they don't care anymore. So it becomes a loveless marriage. There's just no caring, and, 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 and never, uh, you, you can never do enough, and, and you try, and you try, and so you just say, uh, just, just forget it. So like I said, many people in here today have one of these hearts. And let me tell you, if you're dealing with any one of those hearts, a broken heart, a poison heart, a half heart, it breaks the Lord's heart. It breaks his heart that you're dealing with that. In, in Scripture, the word salvation in the Greek is the word sozo. And sozo means whole. That's God's plan for your life, is that you would have a whole heart, a whole plan, a, a, a whole life. Meaning, Jesus' work on the cross, I, I've just left this cross up here because I think of, uh, of all that he did for us on the cross. His, his work on the cross wasn't for your, your, just your spirit alone. It, and I've said this many times, it wasn't just so you could go to heaven. His work on the cross, what he did on the cross was for your mind for your heart, for your body, for your soul, for your spirit. He died so that you and I could be whole. And a broken heart, I can tell you, is not God's will for your life, but it is his will for your heart to be healed. That is his will. So in order to, to do that, to, to work on this heart and heartbreak, I think, I think one of the things you need is a heartbreak buddy. You ever heard of that, a heartbreak buddy? Uh, I, I know, fellas, you probably never heard of it. Because, guys, we don't, we don't need heartbreak buddies. I mean, we, when we experience breakup, we just get quiet. We get stoic. We just, but, but girls, ladies, they need a heartbreak buddy. Someone to help them process the pain. And so today, I'm going to be your heartbreak buddy. Okay? So um, I brought some things that we'll need because uh, every heartbreak buddy needs this. And so I got some things that we're going to need uh, for this. Um, blanket. Chocolate. A scented candle. These are the things you need when you're going through heartbreak. And you call your heartbreak buddy. You get your blanket and your chocolate and... Matthew McConaughey movies. I mean, how many know what I'm talking about? How, so, these things will, no, no, look, we can, wait. I, these are all good, but 
I tell you what we're going to use today. More important than all those other things, the Word of God will help you deal with the heartbreak. And that's what we're going to use today. We're going to use God's Word to deal with the heartbreak. And we're going to go to Abraham. You know, I, I look at Abraham's life, and I, I studied Abraham's life, and I look at all these things, and, and most of us remember the supernatural moments of Abraham's life. I mean, uh, the call to leave the familiar where he stepped out. Wow, powerful. The miraculous birth of Isaac that he waited for this, this promise and, and the unyielding obedience to take and sacrifice his son to go up the mountain. We, we remember all these moments. And, and, uh, but people, few people really remember, remember the heartbreak. Few people remember that. Genesis 23. Look at Genesis 23. Let me show you this. Uh, Abraham, uh, Sarah, his wife, uh, was 127 years old when she died. She died at Kiriath Arba, now called Hebron, in the land of Canaan. And there Abraham mourned and wept for her. Then leaving her body, he, he said to the Hittite elders, Here I am, a stranger and a foreigner among you. Please sell me a piece of land so that I can give my wife a proper burial. Now you can imagine what Abraham was going through. I mean, all the years together, I don't even know the number of, of years that they were, were married, but uh, uh, we know it was many, many years. And they had, we, we read their story of the ups and downs and the trials and the betrayals and all the dysfunction that they, they stayed together. They made it, they made it through. But his response, I think, some great victories, but also some big heartbreaks. And now she's gone. She's gone. And, and so what was his response? And I think if we look at his response, it kind of gives us a little bit of a pathway to healing. When, when loss is lingering in your heart, well, we saw the first thing he did was he had a funeral. And sometimes you just got to have a, have a funeral. It's, it's easy to overlook, but when when Abraham experienced loss, he set aside this, this time. And obviously, now if your loss is due to a, a, a breakup or a, a divorce, or maybe it's not even a, uh, maybe it's a business relationship or a family, may, maybe some other circumstances where the person that you're heartbroken over is still living, and you won't have a, a literal funeral but what you do need to do is set aside some time to grieve. Funerals are an intentional time to mourn so that mourning doesn't consume you. They, they remind us that it's, it's okay to be sad, but it's not okay to become sad. There's a big difference there. And the, and the, the feeling of, of pain is kind of like a warning light on your dashboard. How many have ever had a warning light come on? On your, your dashboard. What do you, what do you do? Well, when light comes on, the purpose of that light coming on is to indicate that something is, is wrong, right? And we can deny it. I don't really, it's not, I'm sure it's not a big deal. We can ignore it, just keep driving, I, like all the taxis in New York. We can assume it's a glitch. It must be a glitch in the op. We can even go to the mechanic and ask him to, it's annoying. Could you just turn it off? Could you just unplug it or something? But if he's a good mechanic, he, he, he'll tell you that it's foolish not to pay attention to the warning signs. So he'll tell you it's foolish just to ignore it. If you don't attend to it, eventually you're going to experience a breakdown. And some of you are having warning lights, you're having pain, you're, you're seeing things, and, and you got to deal with it or else, uh, but, but, the, but the, the feeling, the pain, and, and so many people, they just rush through this this loss. They rush through what they're going through. And, and the feeling of pain is the first step toward healing the pain. Feeling the pain is the first step toward healing the pain. And the longer we avoid the feeling, the more we delay the healing. So you got to deal with it. We can numb it. We can ignore it. We can pretend that it doesn't exist. The, the counselor um, says when, when, when Christine and I when, I, when I went to marriage counseling for her, You know, they tell you, you're, you're an avoider, or you're a, a, a vacillator, or you're, you know, they have all the, and, and they said, I'm, I'm just a classic avoider. I just want to avoid the pain. Uh, 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 I, thought, I thought she said, avoid her, but they said, avoider. Uh, okay. Um, 
the counselor actually thought that was a good one, wrote it down, said, I'm going to use that, I'm going to use that. But, but uh, uh, all these options, you can try to avoid the situation, but the feeling of pain says, i got to deal with it. All these options uh, lead to eventual breakdown, numbing it, ignoring it, pretending it doesn't exist. You're going to end up with a breakdown, not a breakthrough. And that's the importance of of hub groups and, and church family and community is we, we say that healing, those, those, we believe healing and deliverance comes in those small groups. The Bible talks about that. And we need one another to walk through this. So don't, don't rush off after Sunday service. Some people just straight to the door. Stay around. Connect with some people. Meet some people. You're going to need, we need each other. That's why we go to the baseball game down a little. That's why we went to the football game. Let's build some. That's why we have movie nights, family movie nights. Yeah. So I can just watch this at home. No, it's so we can come together and hang out together and spend time together. Yes. Importance of community is, is important in processing the pain. So if you're dealing with heartbreak, number one, have a funeral. Take time to mourn the loss. Don't ignore it. Don't rush through it. You got to feel the pain. Number two, a second thing, honor their memory honor their memory. Sarah's death, Abraham was living in a region that uh, was ruled by a tribe called the Hittites. And, and because of the influence, the Hittites rulers, because of Abraham's influence, the Hittite rulers wanted to, to donate a burial place for Abraham. So they, they chose uh, one of the finest tombs and, and said, you can bury her there. And no one, no one would, was refusing to help him. But Abraham had a different thought in mind. He had, a, he had a, he's something different he was thinking. You can read it. Uh, go down to verse 7. And Abraham, uh, Abraham bowed low before the Hittites and said, Since you are willing to help me this way, would you be so kind as to ask Ephron, the son of Zohar, to let me buy this cave at, at uh, Machpelah down at the end of his field? And I will pay the full price in the presence of witnesses so that I will have a permanent burial place for my family. Now, Abraham here refuses their generosity because he wanted to honor his wife and have a memory of her in a, in a different way. I think, there's, I think there's something beautiful about this because in the wake of, uh, of loss, our minds so many times want to drift to regret. A lot of times in, in a loss, especially in a, in a relationship, will drift to the worst moments in the relationship. And by, by letting our minds go there, we're tempted to focus on all that was wrong and all that is wrong and everything with, with everybody in the relationship. And, 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 and the Bible tells us in Philippians chapter 4 that we're not to put our thoughts there. We're not to put our minds there. Brothers and sisters, one final thing. Fix your thoughts on what is true, honorable, right, pure, lovely, admirable. Think about things that are excellent and worthy of praise. Now, I understand if your relationship was lost to uh, dysfunction, abuse, those kind of things in a relationship, it's very easy to um, meditate on those things, the things that were said, the wrongs that were done, uh, uh, the things that you had to endure. But I, I want to encourage you in the process of that, my mentor, uh, John Maxwell, just wrote a, a new book called The High Road Leader. And we've been talking about this as a staff a lot through the past, uh, even even past two or three months, uh, dealing with different things. Always, we should always take the high road. Let's be people that take the high road. And, and here, this is, what, this is what I'm saying is, is, is avoid dishonoring them. It's the high road. It means, it means don't assassinate their character to others even if they do it to you. Oh, shoot. Yeah, I don't like that either. I don't even know why I put that in here. Don't run them down to your kids. I had no good mama. I had no good dad of yours. He doesn't. Don't remind everyone of what they did. As your mother used to say, if you can't say anything nice, right, don't say anything at all. I tell you this, you'll never find God's blessing by cursing someone else with your words. And they could be the, you know, uh, uh, find, you can find something. Well, that's a nice earring. It may be, you may be really reaching for it, but do your best not to dishonor. Um, don't linger on the worst moments. 
Don't linger because it, it, it's only torturing you. In the past, I've, I've had people tell me how uh, they were angry at this or angry and, and they had a fence or, or whatever. And, and obviously we want people to resolve. If, if anyone has a fence against me, I want to resolve that offense. To, I, I don't know if you don't tell me. And, I, and, and a lot of times the other people don't even know. They're just living their life. You're the one that's suffering from it and dealing with it and angry about it. And, and, and here's the truth. All the time um, that you felt that way, I didn't feel anything. I didn't even know. So revisiting painful memories doesn't affect the person at the center of them in the least. You just end up torturing yourself. So even if your relationship ended terribly, there has to be some good memory. There has to be some good memory. Choose, choose to remember, remember that. I remember I dealt with a, a painful loss, a heartbreak in a, in a business relationship. Uh, a, a partner I, I'd entered into a partnership with, and I, I'd known the guy for years. I'd trusted him. I knew him for years, and he ended up just turned out to have no no integrity and and changed everything. It, I just I lost hundreds of thousands of dollars in the process, and and I was I was angry. I was angry. I was upset. I I carried it. I carried it for a, a while, and, uh, and and but but I had to I had to realize that. Uh, He's probably, maybe he's not even thinking about this. I haven't talked to him in a couple years. I'm still carrying it. I'm still upset. I'm still thinking about, you know how much money I lost in that thing? I, and I'm carrying it, all this pain and regret. And, and, and he's not even thinking about me. I'm devastated. And I had to go back and see, what does the Bible say? The Bible says that all things work together for my good. So somehow, some had to work out good out of that. So I started thinking about that whole process why I am where I am today, what got me here, what happened there. And I'm like, all of a sudden, I'm like, you know what? I wouldn't be here if I hadn't gone through that. I wouldn't have learned this if that hadn't happened. And so I said, let me change my focus. And I just called him and said, you know what? I forgive you. You might not even thought about it. I just want you to know, I forgive you. I'm not caring anymore. And let me think of the good things. You know, I got, he bought me this really cool suitcase that I use. And so that's, that's about it. But, uh, <laughs> Uh, I like that suitcase, and so I, I, I focus on that because I get a lot of compliments on it. And uh, and and so, but I wouldn't be here if I hadn't gone through that experience. So don't focus on the worst. I, I remember, I, I can, I mean, I could through that. That was a business relationship. Maybe it was a divorce. I, I think about the loss of my brother, my brother, twenty years ago. He was my best friend. We worked together every day, and one day. He walked out, walked out. I haven't talked to him in 20 years. My parents haven't heard from him in 20 years. He walked out on his wife and two kids, four years old. You've met some of my nephews have been here, four years old, six years old, and devastating. No communication, no understanding. But, but what, what, what do you do with that pain? What do you do with the loss of your best friend, your brother? He, his boys have grown up 20 years without a dad. My parents devastated by the loss of their, their son. I mean, they, they, at least they got the best one still, but <laughs> see, you got to find something in the process of it. And seriously, though, you've got to, I can think back, oh my gosh, I remember when we did this. I think, oh gosh, yeah. and I got to remember, I can't think of the loss of the last 20 years. I've got to think of the joy of the moments that we had together, and, and then I have to still believe, because when I tell you I've been believing, how many have been believing for stuff longer than a year, two years, five years? When I say that, I know, because I've been believing for 20 years, Acts 16, 31, that my whole household would be saved. I see the heartbreak in my, in my mother. But you gotta honor the memory. I can sit, I can't believe, I can't, what a jerk walk out on it didn't take care what an infinite you know i could go on all that kind of stuff but i've got to choose i got to choose honor honor their memory uh, number three number three return to your first love if you're dealing with heartbreak return to your first love what what, what, what do you mean by that well in the wake of sarah's death abraham focused on god he focused on God who, who had called them both three years uh, or many years uh, ago together. And uh, he, he recounted God's faithfulness. 
He recalled God's provision. He relived the moments where, where it, it looked like there was no way, but yet God made a way when there was no way because how many know God will always make a way? You think there's no way out of the situation you're in? God said he will make a way where there seems to be no way. And he revisited the promise of God that, that God had made. Every time, every time he saw his son's face, he remembered. And by doing this, he opened up to, uh, to the only one that can really mend a broken heart. Yes. Psalms 34, verse 18 says, The Lord is close to the brokenhearted, and he rescues those whose spirits are crushed. The Lord, you know, notice it says Lord there. The Lord, it didn't say God is close, your Savior. It didn't, it didn't say healer. It said the Lord. Lord means ruler, right? Lord means ruler or leader. So in heartbreak, it's very, it, it's, it's not uncommon for our emotions to unseat God in our life. For our emotions to unseat God as the authority of our lives but in order to heal you've got to return to God you got to return and you got to return God to his rightful place of authority over your life meaning that his word has to be what governs your thoughts his word has to be what governs your emotions his word his, his ways have to inform your actions not yours not your emotions not how you're feeling his priorities have to become our priorities. And the more rain he has given in your life, the more restoration you can expect. The truth is that this verse is commonly cited among uh, in tragedy, but, but I'm, I'm not sure it's always comforting. He'll, he'll comfort the brokenhearted. He'll heal the broken heart. But because, because when you're reeling from loss, when you're going through loss, it doesn't feel like God is close at all. Maybe you've been there. You're like, I feel like God's so far away. Over the years, I've, I've learned that, that, that the, the question isn't if God is close to you. The question is, are we closed off to God? Does the pain, the heartbreak close us off to God? God's always close to you. I had a friend, a pastor friend who went through a, a, a divorce and, and uh, I was just thinking about him this morning and God's call and God's purpose was still on his life. But because of the, the way that he was, the church shamed him and, and, and the things that happened and what he went through and, and he, his, he thought, my life is over, my ministry is over, God will never use me again, his call was over. But God's, God was still close and God is still close even though the heartbreak of what he went through and what happened in his life, he was closed off. God was ready to use him much quicker than he was ready to be used. The reality is, some of you need to open your heart again. Open the scriptures again. What does God's word say about the situation you're in? Some of you need to open, be open to pray again. Maybe you're watching online. He said, I just haven't even wanted to go back to church. The heartbreak I'm dealing with, the pain that I'm dealing with. Some of you need to open your ears to hear that still small voice again to hear from God again and, 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 and speaking let him speak even in the midst of anger even in the midst of your disappointment your agony your, your aggravation and this is why I worship that's why I tell you don't be late Come get, when, get here in time for worship there's so much healing I'm telling you I've, I've heard miracle after miracle that takes place not when we laid hands on people but just in a moment of worship. In worship, that's a, that's a time when God can touch your heart. That's why worship is so vital because it's like, it's like a time for rehabilitation of the heart. It's every time you open your mouth to, to praise, your heart opens up a little bit more. Every time you lift your hands in worship, the heaviness just lifts off a little bit more. Every time you sing about what God has done, your demeanor softens just a little bit more. 
Every time you celebrate his goodness, he rehabilitates your soul just a little bit more because to, to worship is to enter into his presence. When we worship, what we're doing is we're going into his presence and in his presence is fullness of joy. In his presence is where healing takes place. In, in, his, in his presence, we're made whole. So healing can take place in moments of worship. I want you to stand with me. Come on, all across the room. Louisville, stand with me just for a moment. I want you to close your eyes, especially if you need healing right now. There's an area of your heart that you're dealing with. There's a song that I asked him to play. It just says, in the presence of Jehovah we're in his presence God almighty prince of peace prince of peace listen to these words right here troubles vanish vanish hearts are mended Oh, we thank you that you are healing the brokenhearted in the presence. See, that's what worship does. It brings us into his presence. If that's you today, you need healing in your heart. I want you just to lift your hands. Come on, just lift your hands to lighten that load and sing it again in the presence of Jehovah. Jehovah. Right there at home. Come on, lift your hand. Right there on your couch. Begin to open your voice. Open your heart to him in this moment of worship. My Prince of Peace and Troubles vanish. Hearts are mended. that again if you say dr. Dave I'm dealing with that heartbreak right now I'm, I'm believing for healing in that area take just a moment I want you to step out of your seat come stand right here in the altar just come down right for a moment if you really want to receive that healing it takes a moment of faith a step of faith just step out of your seat right now don't be embarrassed don't worry about what anyone else is thinking let's just agree get into the moment get into the altar We're starting to come. Just step out just, just for a moment. Come on. Trouble It may be a relationship. It may be the loss of a loved one that you can't just seem to get the heaviness on. It could be a family member. Maybe like me, you dealt with a business relationship that you just... You just couldn't let go. Come on, one more time. Sing it. Come on, just lift your hands right now. There in Louisville right now, God's healing hearts. He's restoring joy right now. Come on. Prince of
everybody. Keep praying. Lord, if one moment in your presence can change everything. Just one moment in his presence. Just one moment in his presence can can do more than 10 years of counseling, than 20 books, 53 sermons. Just one moment in his presence can change everything. And I, I believe in counseling. I believe in hookers. I believe in reading. I believe in all those things. But what if he could do it in a moment? What you've been dealing with for years, what you've been carrying, let his presence, as his presence fills your heart, every crack, every broken spot just begins to be filled. One moment in his presence. Let me give you one last thing. You can stay standing because I'm going to close this quick. Be open to love again. Be open to trust again. Be, be open. I, I, thought, I thought I knew Abraham's story. I mean, I've, I've heard it my whole life. But studying, I, you know, I never really thought about it. I never really realized, you know, he remarried again. He got married again. You can read the, the whole thing. I won't take time to read it there in Genesis 25. But what I got out of that is maybe I'm not, maybe is, isn't a marriage for you. But you can love again. I mean, they think how long Abraham and Sarah were, were married. And after that long, I mean, my goodness, they knew everything, I'm sure, about each other. Their lives were blended. The Bible says two became one. And the, the idea of finding someone else, of moving on and loving again, probably was a pretty daunting uh, thing for Abraham. Moving on from the heartbreak of the loss of the, the love of his, his life probably seemed to be impossible. And maybe the idea of you sharing life again, maybe it was through a divorce, the, the, the idea of, of maybe, maybe you did lose a, a spouse. Maybe it's, it's the fear of starting a, you, you started a business and it, and it didn't, and it failed and it broke your heart and you, you lost everything and, you, and you're like, I just, I can never try again. Whatever it may be, it may seem insurmountable, but I look at Abraham and what he did, he, he did what seemed insurmountable what seemed impossible, but is possible with God, he moved past the heartbreak. He moved past the heartbreak, and, and, uh, and, and that should encourage all of us today to move past. It, it should, maybe it's, it's, maybe it's a relationship with a parent, that you're dealing with heartbreak from something that a parent did to you. It should encourage all of us that in a, that in a season of loneliness, that your lonely days are numbered, that, that you can share love again, you can share 
friendship again. Maybe you were brokenhearted in a church. You can share community again. It should encourage you that in seasons of transition, maybe you're in a season right now of transition, and I, uh, so I know so much has, has changed, but you changed also. God's done things in you also. And you're, you're better because of it. God's spirit has, has equipped you and, and for what's ahead. So you're not at a disadvantage. You're not adrift. A, a you're, you're, just, you're just discovering a new chapter. There's a new chapter in the book that was, that was written. And, and the book's not over yet. God doesn't, uh, you didn't know God has so much more planned for your story. Finally, I want to encourage anybody who may be in a, a, a very different place, maybe a difficult place. Maybe you're in a, maybe you're in a loveless marriage. You're like, how could God ever restore that? You, you share the, the title, we're, we're married, but and you see Abraham here. You live separate lives. This means that uh, when we saw Abraham not only got remarried, but he had six more kids. I mean, think he was, what, a hundred when he had the first one? Or had uh, Isaac after that? Six more kids. I mean, that means he didn't just get married. He re rediscovered an active love life. So that should give you hope right there. Your marriage may look like it's, it's been placed in a tomb. But how I many know God can resurrect? God can resurrect it. He can resurrect your relationship. You've got to begin to speak life. You've got to begin to, to believe. You've got to begin to trust God with your partner's heart again. Wherever it is you're facing heartbreak today, whether you're here with a hard heart, maybe you're just half-hearted, whatever. Maybe you're a poisoned heart and you're cynical. And I believe that just a moment in his presence. And I hope if you would, if you lifted your hand, you received that today. You felt that heaviness you you felt God turning that heart of stone into a heart of flesh father I thank you today that you are our healer not just the healer of our physical pain but you are the healer of a broken heart and I thank you that you are healing you're restoring you're Lord you're giving hope again Lord I thank you that a moment in your presence we leave changed in the presence of Jehovah, troubles vanish, hearts are mended. Lord, I thank you that you are mending and beginning to mend broken hearts today. In Jesus' name. That's our goal. That's our relationship goal with you today, God, that, that, that we would have a heart after you, that we would have the kind of heart that you would want us to have, a pure heart, a healed heart. You know, if you're here today, heads bowed across the room, just gonna look across the room just one time. We never wanna close the service. If you're online, down in Louisville, and you've never given your heart to Jesus, one of the best things, well, the best thing you could ever do is say, Jesus, you can have my heart. When he takes your heart, he begins to mend it. Maybe you're here and you've never said yes to Jesus. You've never asked him to live in your heart. You want to become part of God's family today. We want to pray with you. We want to agree with you. And we want to welcome you, invite you in. God loves the brokenhearted, but he also brings healing to them. So that's you today. As a matter of fact, I just want everyone to say these words with me. If you're today making a decision to put God first place, you say, Dave, that's what I need to do. I'm making a decision today to put God first place in my life or to put him back first place in your life. Maybe you've slipped away you become far from god the best decision you could ever make today is to say god i give you my heart i want everyone to say these words the bible says if we'll just believe in our heart and say with our mouth jesus christ is lord we'd be healed so i want everyone to say those words with me say jesus christ is my lord lord i thank you that that salvation comes in those words that healing comes in those words. Lord, in just a moment as we partake of communion together, Lord, I thank you that you're continuing to do an incredible work in us and through us. In Jesus' name. 
I hope today's message was an encouragement to you. And if it was, please take just a minute, like this video, uh, hit the subscribe button so that every time we bring out a new life-giving message, you will be the first to know. We'd love to hear from you. Put a comment in there and share. Why not share this great message of hope with someone else? We look forward to connecting with you more and please visit MotorCityChurch.org. We'll see you next week.